When this picture was taken of me in my lateral pelvic tilt, which was also an anterior pelvic tilt, in reality, it was an extension pattern. You, the idea that that issue was caused by my jaw and my lack of teeth sense, molar sense and canine sense, I'm not sure I would have really believed it, but in reality, that was the case. And I'm gonna show why that was. And it turns out there is a direct link between your hip flexors, which have to be overactive, hip flexors and psoas, which have to be overactive when you have a lateral pelvic tilt. There is a direct connection between that jaw and those hip flexors. And the key to it is this vestibular system. The ability to run, jump, walk without compensation, without pain, is really depend or lift weights, whatever you want to do, is really dependent on a functioning vestibular system. No one really knows they have a vestibular system until it goes wrong because you start getting dizzy and you get vertigo and all sorts of other weird symptoms and you lose your balance and you fall. So it's always running in the background. It, it really allows the rest of us to function normally. When the vestibular system is upset, and the way it gets upset quite often is because there is a lack of sensory input from something, visually, from the auditory system, from the lack of head and neck movements because you've become tight, and then sent, uh, input from the ground. Also, there's these visual reflexes that sometimes don't work properly, but again, that's visual. Uh, you, know, you could have inner ear problems, the vestibular, the vestibule, that can happen also, but all of postural restoration, this, what I do and what so many other people are now doing, uh, it's all, we're all dealing with vestibular issues on one level or another because everything we do, if once we get stuck in one position, let's say on our right side, which is this left AIC, right BC, right TMCC pattern, it's a extension pattern, it's a threatened position. It's, it's where your brain puts you to feel stable. Once you do that and you're no longer using the left side effectively, your head and your neck are no longer rotating the way they are supposed to. You're, you're actually losing vestibular input because you're not going to be seeing as much of the world as you normally would because your head is stuck in one position. An effective vestibular system depends on a head and neck that can rotate in all directions and side bend to produce movement that allows you to use both sides of your body but that can get upset when your jaw and your teeth, when there's an issue with your jaw and your teeth. So in this book, when they talk about how a vestibular system is altered by altering sensory input, the brain will choose a strategy, a compensatory strategy to stabilize that individual. And they're going to do it through their lower, their, their lower leg muscles. So, you know, uh, their calf muscles, tibialis anterior, your shin muscles, let's put it that way, your lower back muscles, your hip flexors, and your neck. And when you over recruit your hip flexors and the psoas will be one of them and the TFL and the rectus femoris, the quads, uh, you'll also over recruit your SCM, the neck and your upper traps. That's what they found in their studies. So that is the direct relation between the hip flexors and the vestibular system. And the vestibular system gets upset when a jaw and teeth are not moving properly. And that is what my problem was. My hip flexors were not the problem they would turn off if my brain could get the proper sensory input that it lost. And I'm gonna show you a video of exactly what I'm talking about. So what you're gonna see in this video is this individual cannot adduct their left leg. This is the adduction drop test that we use in postural restoration all the time. This is a hip flexor test. This is telling us if he cannot adduct his left leg, his hip flexors, his psoas, his TFL, are overactive. He did not sense his left molars. He only sensed his left canines. So you're gonna see what I did to get him to be able to pass this test. So here I bring his leg back. His left hip is not neutral. His hip flexors on the left side, his psoas are overactive. He cannot adduct. Now all I'm gonna do is he puts a tongue depressor between his left molars to give his brain molar sense, vestibular sense, and he can now adduct, so his hip flexors are off, but now he takes the tongue depressor out again and he just allows his teeth to touch naturally, how he just normally exists in the world, and you shall see what happens. He loses his range of motion. He can no longer adduct. His hip flexors turned on again. That was a neurological phenomenon. I inhibited his hip flexors, turned off, uh, released his hip flexors through a neural brain mechanism which was give his brain a sense of what it lost sense of, which was his molars, because he was only sensing his left canines, his right canines, and his right molars. 
those four areas are the pillars of the mouth and they are the pillars of jaw movement. And there is a jaw movement really makes us human. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain why over the past hundred million years or so, uh, mammals and then humans in particular developed a particular set of adaptations that allowed us to thrive. And some of those, those, some of those adaptations are becoming warm blooded, uh, an increase in brain size, which required more calories, and that, of, that re required more efficient chewing. Previously, most animals, they chewed and their, their jaws would just do this, like an alligator, right? Everything was just up and down. The ability to rotate the jaw from side to side in a circular motion as we chew is what makes humans human. That is called a lateral trusive movement. Dentists know about lateral trusive movements. You, the jaw should be able to move forward and to the side without restriction from other teeth, cross bites, open bites. That creates problems with lateral trusive movements. And we discussed this in the, in the interview that's following this section. So that literally makes us human. Now this thing, this is the thing. If you cannot chew appropriately because you do not have lateral truce of movements, your brain's going to know it and it's not going to like it. But disregarding that fact, the ability for your jaw to move freely is also what allows the neck to be free. Because look at all the muscles that directly or indirectly attach to that jaw. Your tongue is embedded in neck muscle. It's part of the jaw. The, all these neck muscles, your jaw is really part of the neck. It just hangs off your head. And you just look at all these muscles that attach to the hyoid bone, which then attaches to the jaw through other muscles. Uh, you'll see a omohyoid muscle. Where is it? This omohyoid. That omohyoid attaches to your shoulder blade. So your ability to raise your arm up and throw a ball without pain relies on a jaw that can move. Otherwise, everything underneath it gets tight. The, you also see, what's one more? Uh, your cranial nerves. The vagus nerve comes out of this very important area. All of, when the jaw is mispositioned or cannot move through full ranges of motion, your body gets stuck because the neck can no longer rotate and side bend. And that becomes a vestibular issue. Your balance gets thrown off and your, your brain, if you cannot move a jaw, the neck tightens up. If the neck cannot rotate and side bend, you cannot shift your body from side to side without compensation and you're gonna compensate with hip flexors and neck flexors and back extensors. And that is why the jaw and the teeth are a vestibular issue, which means that is a whole body movement issue. And that is why people who do not have sense of their mouth or have, like I said, open bites, missing molars, missing cane, whatever has been pulled, teeth that have been pulled, that upsets the vestibular system. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna have overactive hip flexors. They're gonna have an overactive neck because the brain is threatened, the body is threatened with falling. They've lost vestibular sense. And that is why I ended up in the position. What you're looking at with the picture of me, that was a vestibular issue. My brain had no clue where I was. I also had an uncorrected hyperopic visual system. So again, I was tightening up as a protective mechanism because this vestibular system had been completely thrown off. And it just so happens that your jaw, how the jaw is not really considered part of the vestibular system is insane to me because the, the, the small bones and thus the muscles of the inner ear used to be part of the jaw pre-human. So the jaw, the jaw bones, the, this one jaw bone used to be many bones, but those many bones migrated into the inner ear. And now we just have this one mandible as our jaw bone. So there's direct connections between the jaw and your inner ear. And it, the jaw is a big deal. That's what I'm getting at. And this interview that I'm going to do with the dentist will explain further why, how he uses these splints and how he makes them. And we talk about it in the, in the, in the uh, context of postural restoration. And when people need these things, it's because they can't inhibit or turn off those hip flexors or those neck flexors. It's not because the muscles are the problem. Trying to stretch those muscles are not going to do a thing for these types of individuals. These, these individuals need to sense their mouth, molars and canines, so they can have appropriate lateral shifting of their, of their jaw so the neck can relax and move and rotate and side bend, which allows the body to do that. Otherwise, you're screwed, like I was. One is a, is a flat plane appliance that covers all the teeth. Like this. 
that builds in an anterior guidance into the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the can other just, one- can you, just, can you just describe anterior guidance? Yeah, anterior guidance means, and this is what in dentistry, why, you know, why we are, why we know that cross bites need to be corrected and anterior open bites aren't the best, mm -hmm. is that anterior guidance is when you have, your front teeth are meant to be, protect your back teeth in lateral and protrusive movements. So if, so your canines are the longest rooted teeth in your mouth and they kind of create like the barriers or walls, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they also have a built-in ramp. And we like, in dentistry, we like that ramp to be a shallow ramp, not a steep ramp. And so we like to see a shallow guidance, meaning that when you slide your jaw to the right or to the left, that canine is gonna lift your back teeth apart. Okay. And as you, as you continue to travel on that canine, the shallowness of that is a, is, a, is a nice shallow ramp. So you're not pushing up a hill. It's a nice glide across onto your front teeth. What would, a, what, would a, what would a non shallow ramp imply? A non shallow ramp would be like a, almost, like a, almost like a class two occlusion with, or a very deep bite. So their front, so their front teeth are coming. Where, sorry, they're, where, they're where you're locked, yeah, where your mandibles locked in place. Okay. So their so, top is it is it because sometimes I'll see top teeth, top the top the the top teeth that come really far down in front of the bottom teeth, and I never know whether that's a good thing or not. Right. That's kind of where the mandibles trapped, okay. and and that and that can be from a genetic component when the, when a person is growing, and it can impede the growth of the mandible. Okay. So it's locking it back. That would be like a tight, yes, deep guidance. So there's like no room for that. Is that what you're talking? Is that what you're talking about? As like a yeah, and then the same thing happened on your cusp is be very. It's, it's, you just can't really quite get there, and you're sort of locked in, almost being in a room where the walls are super close, closed in. Yeah. So you're gonna, and, so you're, gonna you're gonna lack mandibular freedom. Yeah. And a lot of times you see a lot of times those patients will have very high vaulted palates, very narrow. Okay. Uh, uh, maxillas and mandibles. Right. So when a PRI therapist thinks that an individual or has determined that they think this person is going to need dental intervention, usually one of these, these people may have a missing tooth, a molar that's been pulled. They may have had teeth pulled to begin with. Uh, they may have cross bites, open bites. So you tend to make so a right. The flat so plans. Plans, yeah, and then there's another appliance really quickly um, where it doesn't necessarily have the anterior guidance. It's more to give the patient an immediate posterior occl occlusion. Okay. A lot of times, um, to, and, and there are specific reasons when, where you use one or the other. And do you know what those are? I know because I know, having spoken to you, I know you prefer... The, the splints with anterior guidance, I believe. Well, you know, I, I don't say that I prefer them, but I, I have learned because I've got a lot of great mentors in the PRI world and I've gone to PRI courses and I've learned. I mean, I, I have learned that sometimes doing the other type of appliance is necessary, and especially when there's a lot of issues with tongue, uh, posturing, Mm -hmm. A lot of times that anterior, and even when I make those appliances now, I really work hard at making sure I've got room for the tongue um, to to be where it needs to be. You're talking um, about you're talking about the the splint without the anterior guidance. Both. Oh, okay. So even with the even with the splint you have, I, I work very hard not to make this so big in the front. Okay. You know, you know I really work hard at minimalizing that. And why do we want to? Why do we want to keep? Because I know that was always the recommendation in PRIs to keep yeah. it as, as as thin as possible, but still to maintain structural integrity. And yeah. do you know why that is? I think it's to get to get that tongue to 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 behave. Basically, I mean, I'm 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 not a PRI PT, so I can't speak to a lot. A lot of it, I get. I'll have the the therapist that I'm working with. It'll say, I would like for you to make me for this patient an M. MOO, which is the one that has the a lingual bar mm -hmm. and, and just the posterior contacts. Mm -hmm. Usually those patients don't necessarily have a TMJ issue. 
mm-hmm. um, but they definitely have an issue um, where they, um, you know, have a lot of issues with, you know, their tongue being a driver and we're trying to calm that down. Right. And um, so I find that that is, helps to tone them down to, to, okay. to kind of, you know, uh, help with that issue. And then the patients for sure, if there's a TMJ issue or a pops or clicks or adaptation of the joint, then I, then we tend to make more the full coverage. Like flat that. Line, correct. Right. But and minimizing the bulk in the front. So also, because the tongue is a very big muscle mm-hmm. and it affects the hyoids, it, it, it affects breathing, you know. Um, how it really, it's should, really part of your neck. I mean, it's just. Part of your neck. It's part and of your so, neck. And that's the big deal from a PRI perspective. Yeah. I first started. Neck tension. <laughs> Yeah, I was making them and making sure I had my guide. I was being a dentist, yeah. but doing what I was taught to do. But then because I was, I would, I'd listened and I wanted to learn. I, and I was, you know, shown that maybe I needed to reduce that and mm-hmm. make it different, that that would be a better, better for the patient, mm-hmm. better for their overall treatment and therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, Anyway, so I so those two appliances are the ones that I make, and I, I think I make more the flat plane full coverage more than I do the other. But when I've done the other, it's worked, and right. it's usually been the therapist that asks me, "This is what I'd like you to make." Okay. So I don't necessarily I don't make that call. Right. Okay. Um, okay. I usually the therapist usually makes that call, and we discuss it, and I'll ask you know well you know why and They'll explain to me and then we'll do it. And now that you've been exposed to PRI, you know that someone might need one of these, not for yeah. TMJ, not for, they don't have any issue with their jaw in the sense that they don't have jaw pain. Yeah. They, they might That's... have hip pain that will not clear up. And yeah. it's, it's weird for, I just take it so for granted now because I've been doing this for so long yeah. and I just, it's just like, yeah, obviously this is what needs to happen. But I, I realize also I have to put my mind back 15 years ago before I found PRI to, I'd probably be pretty uh, kind of puzzled by the, if someone said, oh, you need, uh, you need one of these for your back pain. I mean, what is the connection? And just now anyone who watches my channel is going to know about PRI anyway, but why from a postural restoration perspective as a therapist, we need this neck to be relaxed. If the neck cannot relax, you can do every pelvis, you know, hamstring technique, glute technique, every PRI technique in the book for hamstrings, adductors, side lying, doesn't matter. If the neck cannot relax, it's all going to have a, it's never going to have the effect that it needs to have because the tension in the neck holds you into extension. So if these SCMs or scalenes or upper traps remain overactive, they keep you up in extension, they keep you neck breathing. And if you can't stop that neck breathing because you're stuck in extension, you can't do these things. You can't do these techniques because the neck is ungrounding you. It's just pulling you up constantly. So if that situation occurs and we take tongue depressors and we change someone's bite just by putting it between their teeth, and I've shown videos of this, and all of a sudden they have these full ranges of motion that they didn't have before and they can breathe. And that's when we kind of have the idea that they're going to need something like this, not for, again, not for TMJ issues, TMD issues, but to allow, for, I guess it would be two things which are completely related. People will overuse their stomatonathic system. So their jaw and associated muscles for stability when their bodies become unstable. And when that happens, the jaw loses its freedom to move intrusive movements. And if the, if the jaw can't move from side to side, like you were talking about, like if you can't get a canine to disclude the posterior mouth, if you can't get that shifting, the neck cannot side bend and rotate effectively, which means everything down low is not going to side bend you're not gonna have frontal plane movement of your rib cage and your pelvis and your legs and everything else. 
So when this is locked, when the jaw is locked up, the neck gets locked up, your head gets locked up in a posterior rotation quite often, you don't have freedom to move your head, and that is very concerning to the brain. <laughs> Those are all cranial nerves. That's a vagus issue. The vagus nerve innervates, you know, part of the vagal system is that accessory nerve that innervates the SCMs and the upper traps. So if those SCMs and upper traps are dysfunctional, that's going directly into the vagus system. And it's high alert when that's occurring. So these are needed to inhibit, turn off that improper stabilization and improper use of that jaw and tongue and associated musculature, right? So that's what they will come to you for but you'll often find open bites and cross bites that are causing this neck to be tense. So just give an overview of the process of how the process would work if the PRI therapist says, uh, this person needs a splint. Yeah, so basically what I do, so it, you know, there's a lot of different ways to make a splint. Most, I think the most important things are that we make the splint on the lower arch because we don't want to trap the cranium. When you have a appliance on the upper arch, you, you basically don't allow for cranial movement and changes. So that's why we make it on the lower. That's now, do, now, to a lot of people, yeah. is it commonly acknowledged at this point within dentistry that these bones of the cranium have movement? I think it is, yes. Okay. I think we now, I mean, we're in, in, in dentistry, I think we can say that there's probably some small movements of the cranium that I think we're open to that. I think in, I, I want to say that, yes, that's, that's true. Okay. Um, especially with the course that I just took, um, at, at this one institution, well-known institution that I think that that was brought up as, as a truism. Okay, good, good. So that that's, I would say, yes, we've, that. Come, we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. But that just still doesn't stop Dennis from making them on the top. Right. a lot. But I, you know, I was one of those dentists who would make them on the bottom as much as I could. And I, not because I was thinking about the cranium, because that's kind of how I was trained to make them. Okay. But then I would sometimes make them on the top, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so anyway, so that is number one. So the patient knows they're going to get a, an appliance made on the bottom. Now, I make mine, I think there's a lot of ways to make them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that I do it, I take good old fashioned impressions. Uh, now there's scanning. There's, you know, controversy about scanning and accuracy. And I think they're coming a long way. I and, think and, imp impressions are where you put the, the, the mold, the, the goo, the the goo and, the, and, the, and you press them down. You have to hold them there. Right? Yeah. So there's scanning. There is, uh, then I do take what's called the face bow, which is a device that allows me to uh, get the position of the maxilla in space. So is a maxilla tip this way, this way, this way, mm -hmm. in three dimensions. Because what I do is I take that and those models, and then I also take a bite record. And, and what's important in that bite record is you'd like your patient to be in, in, their, in their most neutral position in mm -hmm. capturing that bite. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in dentistry, a lot of times we would look to CR, central correlation. Um, and, and so, um, but a lot of times what we'll do is, you know, and I've seen this, I think I've seen Ron do this on videos where he's actually manipulated the patient to get them in the most neutral position. And then the bite was captured. So he'll, be, he'll, he'll, he'll literally be holding their head yeah. in his hands, putting him into a a state of neutrality, neutrality. That they can't get on their own. Correct. So that they and, can, so you can make the impressions on a neutral. Yeah. And that would be for the bite record, most importantly, because that this way, when you build the splint, you're building. What, what, is, a, what is a bite record? A bite record is the position of where your teeth meet, okay. where they touch. So when you're in neutrality, your bite might touch in a different place. Mm -hmm when you're not in neutrality right. and that's why we want to get people neutral right. as much as some people you can't get neutral so but right as much as possible you want to get them that's neutral possible. before you go through that process yeah so that's kind of what we try to achieve okay 
So those would be important things. And then in the making of it, you know, I make my own, you know, I'm in the lab and I'm making my acrylic and, you know, it's kind of very old school method. A lot of people will send it to a lab and get an appliance back and that's fine too. I mean, that works. Um, so there's, there, you know, is I think the most important thing is that it's made on the lower and that you make it as streamlined as possible. You make room for the tongue. And when we deliver that appliance, and here's a paradigm shift in dentistry, um, and here's why I kind of sometimes get raised eyebrows, is where I deliver my appliance, I deliver it in standing. Standing, right. The patient is standing in front of me, and I have the marking paper between their teeth, and they're uh, doing, we're, we're looking for balanced occlusion, from the back molars to the cuspids. And, and cuspids the, are, what are cuspids? The, uh, the canines. Okay. So and canines, then, canines and cuspids are the same cuspids, thing. Yeah. Okay. And bi, the, the, bi, the, the bicuspids are like premolar? Or? Premolars. Yeah. Yeah, correct. And then we're looking for lateral movement to be shallow, to the good guidance, the disclusion of the posterior teeth. So, so we can all, so we can be assured so we can be assured that a head and neck can and rotate and side bend and do all these things. And their hips can move. Yeah. I mean, all of those things kind of come into play and loosen up when the mandible begins to loosen up. Absolutely. So as the patient begins that movement, sometimes they can't move very much at the beginning. Yeah. But by the time I we oh, I was one of them. Yeah. Then we get you. I couldn't, I couldn't. Yeah, and you're like, really going. Yeah. <laughs> and you said, oh, we're going to get it to move. And, and it yeah. did. It did. And, yeah. then the, and then the other most important thing that's a little bit difficult for in dentistry or for dentists, I think, uh, uh, is that you may see, we look for these marks on our appliances, dots and dashes, which you, we, we call. And what happens is that we may see equal pressure dots and nice dashes, but the patient may not feel those dots that we see. And so- Which is a really strange thing. thing. <laughs> and so, so you've been doing this long enough where you just take it for granted. Right. <laughs> but so you, it's like, how do you not feel that? Your teeth are clearly touching. Right, and so you have to ask the patient, the dialogue, do you feel that? Mm -hmm. And even if you see it and they don't feel it, they don't feel it. They don't, their brain is not registering that it exists. Your adjustment until they feel it. Mm. And, it, and it, that is a difficult thing because for a dentist, if we see it and the patient's not feeling it, you're thinking, well, I know I've got it because I could see it. Yeah. You know, we're all about seeing is believing. Yeah. And, and, and you have to trust that that patient's brain and nervous system have not gotten there yet. And that's the thing, the, yeah. their brain, their, their brain. nervous system, not what you're yeah. seeing, right. what they're sensing is completely, I mean, again, when, once you've done this long enough, you know, yeah. you see things where people think they're standing on their left leg and their upper body is completely over on the right side and they have no clue. And I've, I've shown videos of this as well. But when I, when, you, when I got this one, what I had no sense of was my left canines. That's right. I remember touching that and I, what am I touching? And you're like, those are the canines. I, I just, yeah. because I was in the, in a faulty position for, and I never had anterior guidance, unfortunately, right. for my two previous splints. <laughs> and it has made a difference. Um, and along with thing, changes that I made to my visual system on my own, because <laughs> because I know that you can order your own glasses on two different websites without providing prescriptions. So I, <laughs> I, I, I think I was being held hostage by my stigmatism correction. Yeah. yeah. It was tightening me up and every optometrist said, well, this is what gives you 2020 and it was never felt right to me and right. contacts don't feel right to me. And so I just go just spherical correction and that's it. Right. And that works so much better for me. So it's these weird things that no one would think of. Yeah. I mean, it's it like, happens, but I had no awareness of those left canines. Yeah. because of the pattern that I was in for, even though they clearly touched, <laughs> but I couldn't sense them. And sometimes in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that appointment, I might stop and just have the person walk up and down the hallway a couple of times and then have them re, re, 
connect yeah just to get them just to kind of get things moving and yeah. or if they're wearing glasses i'll say well take your glasses off now now i want you to touch yeah. and you know why and especially if they you know um you know, you'll be amazed by just taking glasses off and how that will change the occlusion. And if they're yeah. wearing the wrong types of shoes, like I had a patient who was a power lifter who <laughs> brought in her power lifting shoes. Of course. <laughs> and she wanted her splint to work with her power lifting shoes so she could have better range of motion. But when she put her sandals on, uh -huh. she changed her bite on her yeah. splint. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so you have to listen to the patient. You have to take into account all these other factors because in dentistry, when we deliver splints, we deliver them lying in a chair. Right. And, and so for me, and I just think just if there's any dentist listening out there, um, I would just say, you know, be open to trying it in a different way. You're still delivering the appliance. Be open to the standing piece. And I think you'll be amazed at what you might or might not find, 